Hey Baylife, welcome to the weekend services. We are so glad that you've joined us on our live stream as we worship our risen Savior. Listen, we'd love to see you and your family. Uh, we can do that by you just sending us a picture of you worshiping with us today. You can put it on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, and just use the hashtag Baylife at home. Or you can send them to us in an email to photos at baylife.org. Now, there are a few other things you can do to enhance your time with us to interact with other lifers. Uh, if you're watching the live stream at baylife.org live, you can sign on to chat with us. Simply click the chat button to the right bottom side of the screen. You'll be able to interact with other baylifers and chat with moderators during the service. You can also have someone pray with you by clicking the request prayer button on the right side of your screen. A private chat window will open and one of our pastors or prayer partners would love to pray with you. If you have kids, make sure you're checking the Baylife Kids Facebook page for resources for family discipleship through their Facebook group. Looking to connect? Well, it's so important right now to stay connected with a community of other believers. Now, while we know that many of you are staying connected online in your life groups, we want to invite those of you who are not yet connected in a group to try one out. We have new sermon-based groups starting up, and it would be a great way to connect with other lifers during this time. If you're interested, just send an email to groups at baylife.org and they'll contact you about the group. In this time, there are many of us who either need help or are in a position to help others perhaps needing or being able to provide food, uh, perhaps finding someone to talk to to sort out our feelings and emotions as we feel lost, or needing or being able to provide help running errands. Listen, all of the info for finding and providing help is on one webpage, baylife.org help. You'll find information on food for your neighbors, on being able to encourage those on the front lines and the COVID units in our hospitals, and much more. If you're not following us on social media, you missed a great time this week. Mark and Eleanor continue to hone their Facebook Live skills. We're live right now, man. Oh, this is all. Um, it, yeah, but shouldn't it be going here? I don't, I don't know. That we should have had this conversation in the Well, pre if it's live, it should be showing up on my laptop when you're live. No? No. Keep going down. Maybe it's down further. You missed seeing Mark's quarantine home improvement projects. And Travis and Mark both shared with us their vinyl collection. I mean, who knew Disco Dancing for Kids was on vinyl? Listen, besides well-needed laughter, we were encouraged as they shared some thoughts from God's words with us. So join us online this week. If you're not following us on Facebook, go to baylife.org Facebook and click like to follow us. Finally, there are three ways to continue to give at Baylife. Online at baylife.org give, or you can text to give. Give from your phone by texting give and the amount you want to give to 813-308-0608. Finally, you can just send your tithe uh, through the US mail addressed to the address below. Once again, thank you for joining us and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We get to partake of communion. So I want to invite you to go ahead and get your elements prepared so that they're all set, even as we begin to worship. God bless you. Come on, let's praise the Lord together. Because we serve an awesome God. Amen. Put your hands together. Here we go.
Amen to that. Amen to the kingdom coming here on earth, to the kingdom coming to our hearts for our Savior reigning in us, even in this season where we are together apart yet again. We have uh, reversed our cameras so you can see the empty room behind us. We miss you and wish you were here with us, but as we await the okay to gather again, uh, we are grateful for this chance uh, to, be together, to be together online. Uh, I'm getting used to talking to a, a lens, and uh, I'm, I'm getting used to being able to uh, worship our God even in this way. Uh, we're going to continue our worship uh, by uh, partaking of communion together, the Lord's Supper. When I think about the Lord's Supper and even this time that we find ourselves in, I, I think about our insufficiency and his total sufficiency for us. When I think about the Lord's Supper, you and I uh, were lost in our sin. Uh, but Jesus, at God's, uh, God the Father's uh, request, according to his will, uh, came to earth, lived, and then died on our behalf. Uh, because we couldn't pay the price, he did. And so uh, as we remember his sacrifice today with the bread and the cup, uh, which I trust you've gathered uh, together for your family to partake of, um, we remember our insufficiency. Hasn't this time in life reminded us just how powerless we are uh, against the things that are outside of us, uh, you know, whether it's a, a virus or, or the economic woes that accompany it. Accompany it. It's, it's a, just a lot of life is beyond our control, but we serve the one who is in control, the one who is able to pay the price, who has paid the price, and who will continue to walk with us. We serve our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, will you join with me now as we remember him together? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for sending your son to us, the insufficient ones, the ones who could not... Uh, um, bridge the gap between us and you, could not pay for our sins. You sent our, your son to pay for our sins, God, and we celebrate him and we remember his sacrifice. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. It says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, it tells us that he took the cup and after supper, he held it up to his friends and he said, this cup is, is the new covenant in my blood. It represents a change in how God is doing things. No longer will you look to the old covenant and to the law and your faith in it to save you. You'll look to me and to my sacrifice. Your faith in me will save you. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. you pray with me? Oh God, I am so grateful, so grateful to you for your son Jesus and for his work on the cross on our behalf. Uh, we who have faith in you know that we are secure because of his sufficiency, because of what he has done. And we are praying, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, break out in us and you would revive us and even in these times of uncertainty, you'd remind us that you are in control, sovereign over all things, God. You are able uh, and you will continue to uh, go before us and provide us a path 
through all of life and especially in this time uh, that we're walking through now. It's all because of you, because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice that we gather in your name to praise you. And we do, we praise you, Father. In the name of your Son, I pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We're about to sing a song that I uh, particularly like. It's, it's taken right from the pages, pages of Scripture. The prophet Zechariah has a vision in his book in chapter 4, verse 6. And, and in this vision, uh, he is being told by God to, to pass a message on to the, to the governor of Jerusalem, of, of, of the region that the Jerusalem uh, inhabited at the time. Uh, it's a guy named Zerubbabel. Everybody say that, you know, fast twice. Uh, or whatever. And, and, and as, as God is coming to Zechariah in this vision, he's telling, hey, make sure you tell Zerubbabel that as he builds my temple, that's what Zerubbabel was sent uh, by God to do that in that time, was to, to reestablish uh, the, the worship of God at, the, at a temple that he would build. And uh, God is, is saying through Zechariah to this leader, Zerubbabel, hey, remember to let him know that it's not going to be by his might or by his power that he accomplishes anything that I send him to do, it's gonna be by my spirit, by my might, by my power, that anything gets done. Now that was true in Zerubbabel's day, it's true in our day, that it's by the, the power of God, the power of his spirit, that we can do anything. And so may you and I not rely on ourselves, we're insufficient, may we rely on the sufficiency of our God as we sing this next song. Let's sing it together.
your spirit, God, not by might, not by power, by your spirit, God, send your spirit,
I place into your loving hands and I am yours I am Well, hey, Bay Life, it is so good to be with you. If you would do me a favor and turn in your Bible to the book of First Peter, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, 3. And today we're continuing a series that Pastor Mark began a number of weeks ago called What Really Matters. With everything going on in our world, I think a lot of us have found ourselves grounded in some ways stuck at home and unable to do so many of the things that we now realize we took for granted, whether that was going out to the movies or working from a coffee shop or even just having the opportunity to meet up with some friends for dinner. And if you're like me, it's possible that at first, this was kind of a welcome relief. It was something of a break from the hustle and the bustle, the busyness of daily life. But I would imagine that as time has gone on, you have found yourself alone with your thoughts in ways that are uncomfortable. Uh, Maybe you've found yourself confronting some issues that you might have been able to ignore or cover up with the busyness of life. And as so often happens in times of crisis, I think many of us are beginning to take stock of our lives. Many of us are beginning to reconsider what is most important, maybe even reevaluate some of our priorities to say, hey, when when this is all over, I think life is going to look a little bit different for me. Some of the things that I thought were important six months ago might not actually be so. And it's in light of all of this that we've been walking through this series, What Really Matters. We've been addressing the things that are actually important of first importance, talking about what is most significant for us as believers, the the, the most important things in life, the gospel, the work of Jesus, the promises of God. And we've been talking about how these foundational realities can help us to face our current moment. And so Mark and I have decided that as we continue this series, we want to tackle the next couple weeks through the lens of the first few chapters of the book of 1 Peter. Now, it's altogether possible that you are not familiar with 1 Peter. The reality is that there's a lot of people in the Western church that know very little about this portion of the New Testament. Over the last few days, I've been kind of sifting through the commentaries and and getting ready for this series. And one of the things that, that people from all backgrounds say is that this book is hardly preached at all in American churches. And it's rarely preached in European churches. In fact, one of, the, one of the scholars I've been leaning on really heavily is a seminary professor named Karen Jobes, and she teaches at Wheaton College up in Illinois. And in her commentary on First Peter, she tells the story of teaching this book to a, a group of students training to be pastors. And one of the students in her class at Wheaton actually said, you know, maybe this book is just not for us right now. Maybe it just needs to sit on a shelf and wait for another generation of Christians where it feels a little bit more relevant. The reason for that is because 1 Peter is a book about suffering. Specifically, the the suffering that comes from persecution. The sort of persecution that we have not experienced in this country. But it has been a book that is deeply loved by churches where Christians are a persecuted minority. It's been a book that has encouraged the, the churches in Africa and in the Middle East in profound and significant ways as they've considered what it means to count the cost of following Christ. It might be helpful to have just a little bit of background about what it is that we're stepping into over these next few weeks. You see, the original readers of 1 Peter were Christians scattered through what in our modern era is called Turkey. They were scattered through the the region of Asia Minor. And Peter lists the the recipients of this letter as those who are living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, 
Asia, Bithynia, and a couple other regions. And that sounds like a relatively tight-knit group of cities, but the reality is that these cities were scattered across an area that was the size of California. And these cities weren't particularly large. So you've got to imagine that the Christians that were in these communities felt isolated. They were distant from one another. They felt like they were on their own as they faced the challenges of persecution because the life that they had been born into because of their faith in Jesus made them different. It made them people who were looked on with hostility and scorn by their neighbors. And so Peter writes this letter to this church in this vast region to remind them that they are not alone. And that even in their suffering, they are sharing in the work of Jesus. Peter writes to a people who are being tempted to abandon their faith because life has grown difficult. And following Jesus is costly. Here's the amazing thing that church history tells us. As we look 100 years, 200 years, 300 years after this letter was written, Some of the most important pastors and theologians and Christian leaders all emerged from this region full of Christians who were isolated, persecuted, and discouraged. People like Basil the Great, people like Gregory of Nyssa, and even back in New Testament times, Aquila, the husband of Priscilla, who's mentioned in the book of Acts, these believers all came from this region of Christians who felt isolated and discouraged. And many commentators agree that the reason why this particular area produced such profound Christian leaders is because Peter's recipients listened to what he said. The the parents and the grandparents and the great-grandparents of people like Basil or Gregory of Nyssa, they listened to Peter and they lived lives of faithfulness even when the road was difficult, even when the road grew lonely. And even though we're not facing persecution like Peter's original audience, I think 1 Peter is still important for us because Peter's goal here is to encourage discouraged Christians, to show them how the gospel forms and informs the way that we interact with our friends and our neighbors, how the gospel gives us hope in the face of hopeless situations. And Baylife, we desperately need that in our present moment, don't we? Maybe, just maybe, our faithfulness to Jesus now will function like the faithfulness of these Christians that Peter wrote to, and it will become the soil from which the next generation of great and courageous Christian leaders grows. So if you have your Bible, do me a favor once again and open it to the book of 1 Peter. And let me just read our passage for today. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience of Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So Peter begins his address to these churches in Asia Minor by referring to them as the elect exiles of the dispersion. Some translations, maybe the Bible that you have in front of you, uh, refers to them as the elect foreigners of the dispersion. And here he's sort of drawing on all of these Old Testament pictures and images and metaphors. One of the things that, that First Peter scholars all agree on is that the people he's writing to are not literally exiles. They're not literally foreigners. They were, were many of them born in the cities in which they currently live. But in this metaphorical way, now that they belong to Jesus, they don't quite feel at home in the place that used to be their home. I feel like I've I've gotten a little bit of a better perspective on this this picture that Peter is drawing on over the years that I've gotten to know my wife. Um, If you don't know this, my, my wife was born in Argentina and was there until she was about five years old when her family felt the call of God to move to the United States 
uh, to work on planting a church. And so they, they moved here when she was five and, and became citizens and established their life here in the United States. And so for 20 years, she has grown up in this particular culture with sort of these particular practices and customs that that we have here in our country. But in 2018, she made the decision to go back to Argentina for a semester to study theology. And so she, she made this journey back for about three months and was excited about the opportunity of going home, going back to the culture she was born into, the place that she grew up, the place that issued her birth certificate, But what she experienced was this strange tension. Because in the most literal sense, Argentina was her home. That's where she was born. But there were so many ways in which she felt out of place. Like her Argentine friends and and family didn't eat dinner until 10 o'clock at night. Which is not normally a custom for us here. If you're eating at 10 o'clock at night, it's, it's probably because you've decided to make like a second run to Taco Bell or something like that. So six or seven o'clock would roll around, and because she was used to the customs that we have here, she she was hungry, and everybody else hadn't even thought about dinner yet. Or she would be invited to hang out with friends or, or, or people that she was meeting through school, and she would expect to hang out for two or three hours. And what she would find is that in, in Argentina, the custom was that you would hang out for a lot longer than that. And so it would be midnight, one, two, three in the morning, six, seven hours of hanging out. And she would go, I really want to go to bed. But culturally, that was just not what happened. And so she found herself in this strange place. Technically speaking, she was at home, but culturally, there was some discomfort there. This is the experience of Peter's readers. This is why he refers to them as foreigners and exiles. They had been born and raised in these cities with all of their pagan practices, all of their debauchery, all of their idolatry. But when they had become Christians, their culture changed. And suddenly, they were out of place in their home country. The reality is that if you're doing Christianity right, this should also be your experience. Because the culture of the world is not the same as the culture of the kingdom of God. The customs of this age are not the same as the customs of the age to come. When we become Christians, in some way we become foreigners in our own land. And so while we're in the world, we don't react to the circumstances of the world in the same way that the world does. We don't mourn like those who mourn. We don't date like the world dates. We don't treat our neighbors the way that the world does. We don't run our businesses the way that the wider society and culture does. We don't treat our spouses and our children the same way. We live as citizens of God's kingdom wherever we find ourselves. And sometimes this produces attention, which is exactly what Peter's recipients are experiencing. So how does this change come about? Well, that's what Peter turns his attention to next. He says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. Now, the reality is that there's a lot here. Uh, Mark and I had initially talked about me doing the first 12 verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. And I realize we're probably going to get through the first two or three. There's probably a year's worth of sermons packed into these first two verses. But but for our time together, let's just focus on a few things. Peter says that Christians have been saved according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And this would have been a profound source of comfort for the believers that Peter was writing to. These are people who are feeling isolated, who feel like strangers in their own home, who feel as though nobody really knows them or understands them and and have attracted the scorn and the derision of their neighbors. And it's to these people that Peter says, even though you don't feel known by the people around you, you are known by God. 
And more than that, that their salvation has happened according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, the, the, the Greek here is only used a few other times in the New Testament, one of which is Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And, and he says in that sermon that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus happened according to God's foreknowledge. Whenever this phrase is mentioned in scripture, it's not some sort of vague intellectual knowledge on God's part. It's not as though God says, well, I knew that these people would pick me, and so I guess I'll just let it play out that way, and I guess that's what I'm stuck with. But it's, it's a personal action. It refers to God's choice that these elect exiles, they have been chosen by God through his definite action, and that should comfort us because if we're in Christ, the same thing is true of us. To know that in spite of all the challenges and all the tribulations that life brings, God has chosen us. And what a difference choice makes with regard to passion and fervor and joy and excitement. When I graduated from high school, I applied to three colleges. Uh, one was FSU, the other one was UCF, and the last one was USF. And the reality is I only did that because I wanted to tell my friends that I'd applied to more than one college. I knew that even if I got into any of the out-of-town ones, there was no way that I could afford to go. And I didn't get into any of the out-of-town ones. So I ended up going to USF. And I, and I loved my education there. I think it's a great school. But, but I'll just admit that like, my time in college was not particularly marked by school spirit. I wasn't going to football games. I wasn't wearing like USF Bulls t-shirts and, and you know, celebrating the school that I went to because the reality is I didn't really choose it. It was, it was the default setting. It was the only place that I could go. And so that's where I ended up. But you can see the difference in passion that comes when somebody gets into the school of their dreams. The, the school that they've been excited about, the school that their family has gone to. When they get to go to the college that they've always wanted to, you see a passion that's born out of the fact that they chose this. And that passion, I think, becomes even more um, intense when not only did they choose this school, but this ch school chose them. When they get offered some sort of a, a scholarship or an incentive to go, that choice fuels a passion. Being chosen produces joy. And to these discouraged Christians, Peter says, listen, you have been chosen. You've been chosen by the Father. And it's because we've been chosen by the Father that he goes on to say that this has happened in the sanctification of the Spirit. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives to sanctify us, which is kind of a, a fancy way of saying it's to make us more holy. It's to teach us how to live righteous lives. This is the job of the Spirit, and that's where Peter goes. He says, we've been sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. Obedience is probably the most difficult part of the Christian life. It's the part that most of us leave out, ignore, or avoid. And many of us unintentionally are operating with a gospel that leaves out the importance of obedience. And we apply that to our evangelism. It becomes too narrow. We look at the Great Commission that says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we set about the task of doing it. We tell people that Jesus died for their sins. We get them to pray the sinner's prayer. We get them baptized, and then we pat ourselves on the back, we add another name to the list, and we think that we've done exactly what Jesus asked of us. But I wonder if you noticed, even as I quoted the Great Commission, that I left out the final portion of it. Most of us don't even realize it because we've so forgotten about it. The words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel are this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The gospel is not just about intellectual assent. It is about physical obedience to the teachings of Jesus. And, and Peter says that the Spirit's work in us is to enable us to obey 
not just to believe, but to walk in accordance with what we believe. A gospel that doesn't call us to obey Jesus' commands is no gospel at all. Baylife, you were called by the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, so that you could walk in obedience. Not so that you could be vaguely spiritual, but so that you could obey Jesus and become more like him. Even when life is hard. Even when things are difficult. Peter says this was done for the sprinkling with his blood. And that's a phrase that maybe strikes us as odd. He's, he's drawing on the Old Testament again. You see, in the book of Exodus, when, when God made a covenant with the people of Israel and with Moses, he did this by the sprinkling of blood. This is a big theme in the Bible, is this theme of covenants. The Bible is not just trying to tell us that God exists, but that God both exists and that he enters into permanent and binding agreements with his people. And we don't really use that, that language of covenants in our day and age anymore, but I think there's still one area of society where we can kind of understand what a covenant is in the biblical sense, and that's marriage. You know, when my wife and I decided to get married and I, I started having conversations with friends of mine, many of whom were not believers, there was still this sort of understanding for them. Marriage is a big deal. Like I had friends who had dated for years. They'd been with their partner for, for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And, and when I said that Mickey and I were getting married, they said, I don't know that I'm ready for that. that that's a huge commitment. Because there's this understanding in our culture, even now, that somehow marriage cuts deeper. That it goes beyond a normal romantic relationship. In the most biblical sense of the word, marriage is a covenant. It's deeper than a promise. It's more than a contract. And, and I've only been married for six months now. I realize that there's so many of us who have been married for so much longer and have learned this to, to such a greater extent than I have. But even in that limited time of six months, I've seen the way that this covenant reorients my relationship with everyone and everything. My relationship with Mickey is not the same as it was when we were dating or even when we were engaged. The money that I make through my job goes into a joint bank account. We decide how to spend it instead of me deciding how to spend it. My time is no longer just my own. I can't go out and fill up all my free time hanging out with friends. We have a conversation. We make decisions together about that. But it's not just our relationship that has changed, Mickey and I's. But our relationship with everybody else has changed too because of this covenant. So we love our parents. We think they're godly people who offer wise and godly advice. And yet, they are not in charge of us in the same way that they were before we entered this covenant. Our relationship has changed, not just with each other, but with the outside world as well. The, the, the point in all of this is that when you step into a covenant, your relationship with everything changes. Your relationship with the person you're in covenant with changes. Your relationship with the wider world changes. And this is what happens for us when we are adopted into the family of God. By, by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. We have entered a covenant and that changes everything. We live in the world now. But we're not of the world any longer. We're citizens of a better kingdom with different customs. And while we're in the world, just like Peter's audience, we will face the same triumphs and trials that our neighbors do. We are all stuck at home just like everybody else. Many of us are facing the terrifying prospect of losing our jobs, just like many of our non-believing friends. And more than a few of us are trying to figure out how to help our kids finish the 2020 school year from the living room. We face the same trials, but we don't face them in the same way. And, and I just wonder what sort of witness we could have as a church 
if we approached the trials and the struggles that are in front of us like the people of a covenant, if we approach the days ahead like citizens of the kingdom, instead of going stir crazy during our time spent at home, what would it, what would it do for the witness of the church if we use this time to find creative ways in our homes to build spiritual disciplines, to develop a rich prayer life, to dive deeper into scripture. In the face of, of the joblessness that so many of our friends and neighbors are facing, what sort of witness would the church have if we looked for opportunities to meet the needs of those who have lost their source of income? And if we, when we face that terrifying reality, if we faced it with the courage that comes from serving a God who provides and is faithful to his promises, what would it say about us as Christians if instead of complaining about being cooped up with our kids, we, we looked at this as an opportunity to spend more time with them, to invest in their spiritual growth rather than just voicing our frustration with how exhausting it is. Brothers and sisters, we live in difficult days. I'm not going to pretend as though we don't. But the church has faced difficult days before. The churches in Asia that Peter wrote to were suffering. But we know from history that as they face these trials, as covenant people with faithfulness, their children and their children's children grew up to be heroes of the faith. May we face our moment with courage. May we face it with endurance. May we face it with holiness. And may we face it with the confidence that comes from being chosen by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, and sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. Would you pray with me as we continue in our time together? Father, we come before you and we thank you for your wisdom, for your kindness, for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We thank you that, that we can rest in the fact that you have chosen us, that we can rest in the fact that nothing escapes your wisdom or your knowledge. Father, teach us to be a people who face the trials and tribulations differently in light of what matters most, that the blood of Jesus has brought us into right relationship with you. Teach us to be a people who face the days ahead in obedience to Christ with confidence, with courage, with holiness, with faith. Teach us to be a people who face frustration and discouragement with uncommon joy and a deep love for Christ and his work. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and we say amen. So as we continue in worship, I want to invite you to sing with us. And as we conclude our service, stick around as Mark shares, or Tom shares a few more announcements with you. Here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the sun, the ever.
Thanks again for joining us for worship today. Before you go, I just want to offer a quick recap of our announcements. If you have kids, make sure you're checking the Bay Life Kids Facebook page for resources for family discipleship through their Facebook group. Looking to connect? Well, it's so important right now to stay connected with a community of other believers. Now, while we know that many of you are staying connected online in your life groups, we want to invite those of you who are not yet connected in a group to try one out. We have new sermon-based groups starting up, and it would be a great way to connect with other lifers during this time. If you're interested, just send an email to groups at baylife.org and they'll contact you about the group. In this time, there are many of us who either need help or are in a position to help others. Uh, perhaps needing or being able to provide food, uh, perhaps finding someone to talk to to sort out our feelings and emotions as we feel lost, or needing or being able to provide help running errands. Listen, all of the info for finding and providing help is on one webpage, baylife.org slash help. You'll find information on food for your neighbors, on being able to encourage those on the front lines and the COVID units in our hospitals, and much more. If you're not following us on social media, you missed a great time this week. Mark and Eleanor continue to hone their Facebook Live skills. We're live right now, man. Oh, this is all. Um, yeah, shouldn't it be going here? I don't, I don't know. We should have had this conversation in the Well, pre if it's live, it should be showing up on my laptop when you're live. No? No. Keep going down. Maybe it's down further. You missed seeing Mark's quarantine home improvement project. And Travis and Mark both shared with us their vinyl collection. I mean, who knew Disco Dancing for Kids was on vinyl? Listen, besides well-needed laughter, we were encouraged as they shared some thoughts from God's words with us. So join us online this week. If you're not following us on Facebook, go to baylife.org Facebook and click like to follow us. We hope you've been encouraged as we've gathered together today. We're praying for you and we encourage you to continue to pray for our city, for our nation, and for our world. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we'll see you next week at our normal weekend times, Saturday at 6, Sunday at 9 and 1045.